It's William Grant Mitchell, and my birth date is March 1st, 1921. I was in the Army Air Force, and that day, in those days, there wasn't any Air Force as such. The Army had a unit, and the Navy had a unit, and uh, there was no Air Force as such. I was the first lieutenant, uh, finally, <laughs> and by the way, that was not as high as I should have been because I flew a captain's position. I served in the European theater, England, from bombed Germany. I enlisted. When I was, uh, when I graduated from Emory University uh, on June 1st, 1942, I knew that I would be in the story somehow. And so I went across and volunteered and on the 9th of June, 1942, I was enlisted. I had followed the history of things as they went along because I was at first at West Georgia College and then at Emory University. And so as such, we were always reading history and reading, kept keeping up with the news. And so I was actually in a dorm room at Emory University when Pearl Harbor occurred. Uh, it was early in the morning when we when I heard, and so everybody was eating breakfast and uh, or else just getting up. But uh, Emory was going on at its regular pace, and we had classes and everything scheduled just like normal. I majored in radio journalism and uh, political science. I had a double major, and the reason I had a double major is that I was uh, given a scholarship in political science to go to Emory. But I wanted to be in radio journalism because that was the big thing on the, in those days. Radio was the big thing. I joined because I knew I would be drafted if I didn't. And uh, I had a cousin who had been a pilot in World War I. And so naturally, I was uh, sort of uh, shifted toward that kind of position. He had been a, a SPED pilot in World War I. That was a, a French plane that uh, he flew, single engine, biplane. Well, I left home uh, just six months after I had joined because they had so many volunteers till they didn't call everyone to active duty right away. I was not called to active duty until January 1943, and I left from the Union Station in Atlanta on a train and went to Nashville, Tennessee, where I was first uh, enlisted. Yes, uh, my wife was a, a student at Emory University when I was, and so we dated together then. She went in, she was a nurse, and she, when she graduated, all the nurses had pretty much to go in when they graduated, and so she naturally joined the Army Air, uh, Army uh, Nurse Corps, and uh, she was immediately given a second lieutenant's position, and uh, so she was in, she was a, a, an officer far before I was. As I said, I left from the Union Station in Atlanta, which doesn't exist anymore, by the way, and uh, my mother and dad took me over there and put me on the train, and uh, I got on the train and went to Nashville. Well, of course, being a uh, volunteer for the Air Force, I had to have many tests. And uh, one of the things we did in Nashville was to go through a whole battery of new tests. We, we had tests when I first uh, volunteered, but those were not uh, as comprehensive by any means as the ones we had at Nashville. I spent a whole week in Nashville going through a series of psychological tests, physical tests, and every other kind of test you can think of. Mostly if I was, um, you know, a dedicated peacenik, if I was going to be against war, and if I would be suitable for a pilot, and if I was afraid of flying or anything like that. We had a, a long series of training experiences. I was uh, nine months in training before I was given my wings. And uh, I was first at uh, Maxwell Field in uh, Alabama, and that was uh, uh, 
pre-flight, that in other words, there was no, no flying involved in that for two months. Then I went to Camden, South Carolina. That's where we first began to fly. And uh, I was introduced to the training plane for the first time. And then later we went to Augusta, Georgia, and ended up at Albany, Georgia. If you weren't good, you had to do navigation training a good deal. But I learned to do navigation training, and I learned to do instrument training pretty well at Augusta. So I did mostly practice flying at uh, Albany. Uh, when I actually got my orders, at, uh, when I graduated from the uh, training, uh, you received your wings and received your orders at the same time. This was October 1st, 1943. There was a, a tradition in the service that uh, you gave your first wings to the lady that was going to be your wife. And so I invited my future wife to come and see me graduate, and she did, and I gave her my wings. And that symbolized something? Yes, that was like a, a, a being engaged. But there was a little conflict regarding the, the wings? Well, <laughs> I guess you'd say so, because my mother was there as well, and obviously she would like to have had the uh, original wings as well. So I had to have two sets of wings, one for my wife-to-be and one for my mother. The orders that I got were to become a co-pilot, and uh, that was unusual because uh, most of the people who graduated went away and became pilots and had crews assigned to them, and they spent a while doing training with their crews. I was sent to a crew that was already formed, and I was sent to uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, and uh, put into that crew. I actually got to Europe at a time when things were still important and still happening, still going on. It was before D-Day, and uh, so it was also lucky because my wife's hospital was sent over about the same time that we were. And so she got there about the same time that I did. Uh, I was sent to uh, the uh, Thurlai base, which was a base of the 306 bomb group, and put in the 368th bomb squadron. And uh, the 306 bomb group was uh, one of the first groups to be sent to Europe, B-17 groups. And uh, it, <coughs> it's written up in a book called First Over Europe. And uh, they went through terrible losses to begin with because they had no fighter escort. And uh, it was important to have fighter escort because the Germans had very fine and very dangerous to us fighters, and uh, Messerschmitts and, and Focke-Wulfs. The crews who had lived there and had gone on missions and been shot down were remembered by being written up on the ceiling above, above the earth. And uh, this was a barracks which had uh, no uh, immediate ceiling, but you went up to the to the rafters, you know, and all the names of the people who were shot down were listed, listed there, the ones who had lived in that dormitory. Well, we were chosen to go to Thurlai as a replacement crew because of some of those who had been shot down, and we were the first replacements to follow. Uh, I flew a B-17, that was what we learned to fly back here in the States, and we took a new B-17 and flew it to England. And uh, the reason we didn't keep that B-17 was because they needed bombers sent to different bases than, our, than the one we were sent to. The one we were sent to happened to have enough planes at the time when we, when we arrived. I was, the, the 306 bomb group had a tradition that the first five missions that a new pilot flew would be flown with a, an experienced pilot. And uh, this was a training situation. And uh, so I was sent on a, uh, for the first mission on a relatively easy mission. It was uh, to bomb uh, over in France on a, at a rail yard. But uh, that ceased with my third mission because uh, the first missions that ever bombed Berlin were in February in 1943, 44. And uh, I was on one of those missions. My third mission, I went to Berlin. 
and I went with a pilot <coughs> who was experienced. And uh, unfortunately, we received a, a, a hit from an aircraft, anti-aircraft gun, and it knocked out number two engine. And so we uh, had to drop out of the formation and come back home alone. What we did was go down really close to the ground. This was the first mission flown by B-17s to Berlin because we hadn't had fighter escorts until that time. Now we had fighter escorts, P-38s, P-51s, and P-46s. And so we were able to go the full way. And uh, Berlin was a, was a major target in Europe. It was the most heavily defended, for one thing. They had 7,000 uh, anti-aircraft guns, 150-millimeter guns, and those things were terrible. And uh, they also had rail-mounted guns that they could call in when they needed them. And of course, by the time you left England and flew to Berlin, they had time to root in all these railroad-mounted guns, and they did. And so it was, the flak was very heavy when we got there. The good part was B-17s flew higher than other airplanes, and so the guns were not as accurate up at that altitude as they were down lower. Nevertheless, they hit our number two engine, <laughs> and we couldn't feather the prop, and so it twisted off and fell down into Berlin. When you feather the prop, you turn it, you turn the blades so that they are uh, uh, on the track of the airplane, and they don't cause a drag. When they, when they, of course, when they're pulling, when they are actually turning, pulling the plane, they have to be turned so that they are pulling against the air, and so we couldn't feather it and it remained turned so that it was facing the way we were going. And so that helped twist the prop off. And down it went into Berlin. We thought that was uh, interesting. We had to leave the formation, drop down to the deck, down to less than a thousand feet above the ground. And the reason for that is that fighter planes had difficulty attacking a plane that was flying really low because they couldn't pull out in time. And so they, that was the safest way to fly home, was to get really low and fly that down that way. They, if they had flat guns on all the towns that you pass. So what you had to do was have a good navigator who would carry you around the towns so that you wouldn't be in danger from the flak. Of course, they could shoot at you with rifles too, that low. But we managed to get home, and that was my first, uh, my third mission. Axis, Axis Sally was a turncoat lady who did radio, and uh, she did like a DJ would, you know, but she commented in between about what was happening in terms of the, the airplanes. And uh, the 306 Palm Group was well known and so Axis Sally talked about us many times and uh, told us that she knew where we were going and there'd be fighter planes waiting for us and the flat guns would be ready for us. And she did this every mission that we went on. Buck Wolf, F-O-L-K-E, W-O-L-K-E, 190. And uh, those were more powerful airplanes than the Messerschmitts. And, uh, they were dangerous, <laughs> very dangerous. And uh, Goring, who was the head of the German Air Force at that time, had a special group of his Focke-Wulf, uh, yellow-nosed Focke-Wulfs. And they were selected pilots who were very, very good. And you really, really hated to go against them. They were very good fighters. They, they, they did what fighter planes do. They attacked the bombers. And uh, they were great pilots. The 306 bomb group was known for its formation flying. It was uh, it flew formations so tightly till all of the plane, all of the guns in the same formation could bear on the target at once. Which that's a lot of guns, a lot of 10 mil, uh, 50 millimeter can uh, machine guns. I'll get it correct in a minute. And uh, we were known as great formation flyers. We practiced formation flying between our missions, and so we were really, really good at it. And I've seen fighter planes 
form a loose very serpent circle above us, look us over, and then go and attack the next two groups okay. down down the line instead of us. A loop fairy circle? Looped fairy circle, circle. Okay. And that's where they form nose to tail uh, circle up above you and uh, look you over <laughs> before they attack. The, the B-17 formations were made up of six ship groups. The leader would be here, a wingman would be here, another wingman there. Then down below you had three more planes flying off this leader and uh, there was a leader there and a wingman there and a wingman there. This made up a squadron, this six ship squadron. And uh, this had, you had a, a lead squadron, a high squadron, and a low squadron. And so that made up the, the formation. We had to fly as tightly as possible. We lapped wingtips. We, we flew closely enough so that the wingtips overlapped. And um, we, this, we used to kid each other about flying so that our whip antennas would tickle the lead plane up above us. <laughs> Actually, we never really got close enough to tickle the lead plane, but we did try to fly as closely as we could from the leader. Um, so one of the missions I made to Berlin, I was flying the lead on the lower squadron, the lower three planes, and so I had to fly really close all the way. The fourth Berlin mission is the one that I flew, that I told you about, where I was flying the second uh, element lead. And uh, it was pretty tough because um, the guns were act more accurate by that time. That was on toward the end of the missions. And uh, they, the, the lead plane turned really close to get out of that flight as quickly as he could. And that left the people who were flying on, on him uh, a little bit. Uh, it was a little difficult, difficult to keep up because uh, you, he turned so fast. Berlin, of course, was the capital of Germany, and uh, we had, and it had many, many rail yards. And of course, transportation was one of the main things in B-17s attack. And so we were there to hit rail yards, and we were there to hit uh, the Reichstag building and uh, other such things as that. Reichstag, that was a, like a legislature, uh, or like our Congress. And so the Reichstag building was very important to us. Hamburg, I flew a Hamburg mission shortly after we were uh, flying on, on our own as a crew. But uh, that was the first time I went to Hamburg. But the last mission I flew in my 35 mission tour was also to Hamburg. That was a major rail yard. That was the biggest rail yard in Europe. And uh, the B-17s went and bombed it. And uh, as we bombed it, we were hit, and it lost two engines, both on the same side, both number one and number two. And so we had to drop out of formation, go down to 10,000 feet so that we could uh, keep the airplane in the air and fly it home uh, alone. Luckily, we picked up two P-47s, and uh, they t escorted us along until we got to Holland. But when we got to Holland, there were more anti-aircraft guns, and one of the B-47s was shot down, and uh, we lost another engine. So we were down to one engine, and a four-engine airplane flying on one engine is not the best kind of situation. <laughs> uh, I, was, I was flying it, yes. And uh, we, what we did, we threw everything that was heavy that we didn't need out because we were then over the North Sea, and so we didn't expect fighter planes or anything like that. And we were heading for an auxiliary field, which was one mile square, concrete, uh, and just inside the coast of England. And uh, what we did was throw out guns, ammunition, arm armor, anything that could be taken out of the airplane and thrown down, because we were actually in a powered glide with just one engine. And we kept that powered glide going until we saw the coast of England come up. And just as we got in sight of England, the last engine quit. And so we landed with no engines at all and uh, glided in and landed.
What did you call that? When That's it called dead stick landing. And uh, it was tough. <laughs> no. that, that was a tough mission. When we first got hit, the plane, the number two engine wouldn't feather. And so it kept turning. And as it turned, it burned out all the, all the oil in the engine. And so the engine heated up and caught fire. And it burned for a while. And we decided not to leave the airplane and jump out, but to continue and uh, try to keep the fire out. And so we did. And it quit because the, the engine got so hot, it stopped the plane, it stopped the props rotation. And then um, we, that, that cooled down and the prop started rotating again and began to burn again. So that periodically happened as we went along to, mm -hmm. from the Ham uh, rail yard to Holland, where we were hit the last time. But the, by that time, the, the uh, engine had seized up and become dead. And so we flew the rest of the way with it dead. I was flying off the wing of the leader. The leader was here, I was over here, and uh, with the new crew. And um, that day, the bombardier decided he didn't like the way the thing was set up to bomb on our first pass. So he took us in a 360 degree circle and came back again. We made two passes on Paris to, to do one, one bombing. What was the target? Uh, rail yards. Again, that was the main target that we had transportation at uh, the time I was there. The new crews were always put in a position that would be as safe as possible because they were inexperienced. And so we usually flew in the lead squadron and either on the leader's wing or down below on one of the three ships that flew under the leader. And uh, that was because the uh, anti-aircraft guns targeted the lead plane, but they didn't always hit it. The thing is, it, usually the, the uh, shells hit farther back in the formation and not directly on the lead plane. And therefore, anyone who was near the lead plane was safer than anyone who was flying farther back. Yeah. Tail end of Charlie was supposed to be the last plane in the formation. <laughs> Tail end Charlie. <laughs> and that was supposed to be the most dangerous position. No, we, uh, most of our missions were either to rail yards are to flying bomb sites. You remember there was a V-1 and a V-2. And the V-1 was a, a like an airplane, but no pilot. It was pilotless. And so it was just aimed at London as a whole, big block of territory. And uh, so we bombed their places where they were launched quite often. Now, the V-2s were rockets, and they were uh, constructed by Werner von Braun and uh, his people at Pinamundi in Poland. And I made a mission there. And uh, that was a 13-hour flight. And uh, we did bomb his target, his uh, uh, factory there. But when we flew over his factory, the anti-aircraft guns got our oxygen supply. And so we were at uh, 35, uh, 30,000 feet, I guess, and uh, we had to drop down in order to be able to breathe. We had what was called walk-around bottles, which would, were little pressure bottles that had five minutes of oxygen in them. And you could put the uh, mask over your nose and mouth and breathe. But that just gave us time to get from altitude down to the point where we could breathe the real air. And that was at 10,000 feet. So that's what we had to do. We had to drop out of formation and go down to 10,000 feet so that we could breathe. That was the one chance that we had to, <laughs> to go to Sweden. You spoke of going to someone going to Sweden. We could have gone to Sweden. We could have crossed over the North Sea and gone to Sweden, but we didn't. We What's went back to England. That was a neutral country. In other words, it, uh, you went there, you could be interned and therefore sit the war out. And uh, so we didn't take that option. We went back to England. Flew two missions on D-Day. We um, went out to see 
England is far enough north so that it has a lot of daylight in the summertime. And this was June, June 6, 1944. And so we took off at 4.30 in the morning by daylight. And we flew our first mission and uh, uh, came back and landed. And the plane was refurbished, uh, had new, new gas put in and uh, new guns, all that. So we took off another time and went out. And the second mission, we went on and came back at 11.30 at night. So we had from 4.30 in the morning until 11.30 at night to make missions. Mostly, again, rail yards. I'm sorry, but that was what uh, we were designed to do. And interesting enough, you had to follow a traffic pattern going in. You had to follow a certain path. And uh, when you bombed, you then turned and came back another path back to England. But you weren't allowed to turn around 180 degrees and head back the way you came, even if you had been shot down. Uh, the <clears throat> this was because of, there were so many airplanes in the air, you would have been causing a hazard to the other planes if you turned around and went back toward the way they were coming. Uh, if they were shot, they went down wherever they had to go. But the United States owned the air that day. We had uh, so many airplanes in the air till there was not a German plane in sight. It was, uh, they, we were shot at, of course, by anti-aircraft guns, but not by fighter planes. There, there was literally no fighter plane in sight that day. Yes, we saw all the uh, ships be taking people to Normandy from England across the, the Channel. And uh, we saw particularly the HMS Rodney, which was a battleship that the uh, British owned at that time. and. Uh, it was bombarding the formation, the um, fortifications on Normandy Beach. Normandy Beach had, uh, it was a long beach, and then it had cliffs that went up behind it. And those cliffs were fortified. They had taken the guns from Romney's uh, African Corps and put them together and put them on that uh, uh, cliff in order to uh, well, keep the people from landing that were going to land there. Uh, Rodney would fire salvos, and it had uh, four sets of four 20-inch guns. And they all, when they all fired at once, Rodney just leaned over almost into the water and then back again. The, the Rodney had its control tower and other things where the captain sat and where other people that ran the ship sat at the back of the plane, of the ship. And all of its guns were forward of that, four turrets forward. And uh, when they all fired, the, the ship just heeled over like that. And we saw it salvo several times on our way in. Well, no, of course, the most amazing things were, were the people coming on the landing craft. And that was terrible, it really was but we could see all those people getting shot and all that stuff. Oh yes, you could see very well from where we were. We were 25,000 feet. And since there weren't any German planes in the air that day, we could fly lower than we normally did. The whole panorama was something that I'll never hope to see again. It was very deadly, that uh, landing. It was most difficult, and uh, they shot landing crafts out of the water, and people were in the water and trying to swim and things like that. It was awful. But luckily, we didn't stay there and watch it very long. It wouldn't have been fun. Only anti-aircraft guns, and uh, there were anti-aircraft guns, but they were busy. Most of them were busy trying to keep the uh, landing crafts from coming ashore. They could lower the guns and shoot out toward the water. The area around Paris was, of course, a, a place where trains came and transferred, you see, to other lines. And so it was a place where you often bombed, in, probably not in Paris itself, but around it. They moved all those guns that they had in Africa 
when Rommel was doing his thing down there. And they brought those guns back and, and placed them along the coast. And uh, in waiting in anticip anticipation that we would come ashore there. And of course we did. Oh, I flew 35 missions in all. I don't remember exactly the number of the before and after. Our last mission, my last mission, was to Hamburg. And uh, I led a six ship group. There were only six B-17s there. We each had a load, a bomb bay load of pamphlets. They were carried in cylinder-like things that burst on the way down and scattered the, the uh, pamphlets widely. Well, we were ordered to fly as high as we could get. And so we kept climbing all the way from England, all the way to, Berlin, uh, to Hamburg. And when we went over the target, I looked at my altimeter, and we were 35,000 plus feet. And uh, so we were as high as B-17 would go. But we dropped uh, the pamphlets. And the uh, idea was to try to convince the Germans they should revolt against Hitler. They had already carried out one revolt against him there in the naval base at Hamburg. And we were hoping, our psychological people were hoping, that they would uh, take that hint and, and revolt against Hitler and the war would be over. But it didn't work that way. So, uh, as I said, we had a whole squadron of um, fighter planes to escort us so that we would be safer. And uh, we went to as high as the plane would go. Then when we dropped our pamphlets, we turned and broke up and went down to nearly sea level as low as we could fly, and flew back home that way. I, we had made up our mind to be married, of course, before I went overseas, and before Sue went overseas. But uh, we did have to ask for permission to be married from the Air Force and the Army. And uh, we also had to get permission from the, from the British. And so we were actually married by the British in a civil ceremony. Then we went back and had a second ceremony at the base in the chapel. So we were married twice. We got married in a clerk's office at the city hall. And uh, then we went back to the base and got married in the chapel. Oh, everybody on base <laughs> came to the, to the media, to the marriage. It was a regular, the, the civil, the um, church, the chapel ceremony was just like any other chapel ceremony. They had people who played the organ, and Sue marched in, and I marched in, and waited. I was waiting for her when she came down the aisle, and just regular kind of marriage that you would have. But she carried a huge big uh, bouquet of flowers. Now, her friends had gathered those up from around the countryside. <laughs> they, they had gotten roses and carnations and things like that, and made a big bouquet that was large. Everybody saved up their sugar rations for a month or so ahead of time and used that to make a cake. And it was a five-layer cake and it had a couple of doll-like figures on top that represented the bride and groom. She was there until she found out she was pregnant. And they didn't leave pregnant, pregnant women in war zones, so they shipped her back home. And that left me over there all by myself. Sue was in a hospital which was equivalent to the uh, MASH hospitals that you heard about later in Korea because they sent all the badly wounded people back to that hospital. And uh, they flew them back and they sent them back by boat and all that sort of thing. So they were so busy that they put the people on eight hours on shift and eight hours off. And they had to do all the eating and sleeping and resting they did in those early hours. The rest of the time, they were busy handling all the people who were injured and sent back from Normandy. Sue was sent home that summer uh, because uh, uh, yeah, you would understand that we were married in, on June 27th, uh, 1944. And you know how long it takes before you're aware that you're pregnant. So at the end of that time, she was sent home. 
She was sent home just before her hospital was sent to uh, Paris. It, all of the other people in her hospital were sent on to Paris, and she was sent to a, a place where she boarded a, a DC-6 and was sent home. She was still there, and I still wanted to stay in England until she was left, of course. And so I wanted to stay over there rather than being sent home. And so I volunteered for a plane called Cycle Relay. And this was a certain airplane that the 8th Air Force flew. Uh, it, it was flown, it was in charge of the 8th Air Force headquarters. So while we flew out of Thurlai, where I was stationed to begin with, it, the plane really belonged to the 8th Air Force. After Cycle Relay, I was ready to go home, of course, because Sue wasn't over there anymore. And uh, I didn't want to stay any longer than I had to. So I would have immediately come home if I could have. But uh, they didn't tell me that it was possible for me to do that. So I was looking for a place to fly and stay over there. What I joined was the 8th Air Force uh, Transport Group, which was a group of people that flew B B uh, C-47s, I'm sorry, not, not B's at all, C-47s. And uh, I had checked out in a, in a C-47 at, back at Thurlai, so I was able to fly that. And uh, luckily, they didn't send me to one of those bases where the transport people were flying. They sent me instead to a place called Grove, England, which was a place that they assembled P-47s and L planes, which were the liaison planes that flew out over the enemy lines and uh, told the people where to fire the guns and so on. Okay, well, the Grove England people let me fly <laughs> an L plane. I had never flown a plane that was less than 220 horsepower, and here I'm flying a little L plane that had 45 horsepower. <laughs> And it was quite a different situation, it, quite a different uh, kind of flying. But I learned to do it, and I flew that. But uh, they offered me the opportunity, you'll notice offered, the opportunity to fly P P-47 to France. And uh, my friend, uh, who was also flying with me on this uh, training mission, uh, said that he was going to do it. So he got in a P-47 and tried to fly it to England, I mean to Germany, to meet the uh, uh, Patton's army and things like that, you know, give it to the people who were doing the fighting. The only thing is he was foolhardy. He went back to Thurlai and tried to do a slow roll over the runway, and he didn't make it out of the slow roll, so he plowed into the runway instead and uh, was killed. So. I was lucky that I decided not to do that. <laughs> when I got to uh, Grove, I met a master sergeant, an old fellow who had been there forever, practically, and he knew the rules of the game much better than anyone else. And he said, you've been over here for more than three months since you finished your combat tour, haven't you? I said, yes, I have. He said, well, General Doolittle, who was the commander at that time, had put out an order that any combat pilot who had been in ETO for three months past his combat tour could request an immediate transfer home. So I did. And so they sent me home on a troop ship. <laughs> and uh, very, well, I had to wait. I had to wait nearly a month in order to be uh, put on the troop ship. And I came back to uh, New Jersey, got on, an air, on a, a train and rode back to the Union Station. And there, Sue and my dad and mother met me, and uh, I was home again. I continued in the Air Force for another year uh, until uh, June 1945, and that's when I was released on points. You said you knew what that meant. Mm -hmm. they, that was a release program that they had that was for people who had distinguished themselves in some, some fashion. And uh, I had enough ribbons and enough battle stars so that I amassed points enough to be released among the 
first group of 10 from the 2nd Air Force. I think it was important. Of course, I got married over there for one thing. That was important. And um, I think that having commanded people and uh, so on was important. I learned how to give commands, and that was something that not everyone learns. And uh, I learned to instruct people who were really my equal or superior in uh, this taking out inexperienced pilots when I was experienced and taking them on missions. That was important. So I learned a lot of good uh, lessons in the time I was in the service. I have a great respect for the Germans. Uh, not necessarily for Hitler, you understand, but for the German people. They were smart. They knew how to do things well. They were great fighter pilots. They built great airplanes. And uh, if they had had enough people, they might have even beaten us. So I was uh, uh, greatly impressed by the German people, but I was not impressed by the Nazis. I think they were terrible people who did terrible things, and uh, I can't say enough about that. I do support uh, Truman's use of it. I think that it saved a lot of lives. It saved a lot of lives because if we hadn't dropped that, we would have gone in with firebombs and literally burned Japan down. And that would have killed lots more people than the atom bomb did. So I support the use of the atom bomb at that time. Yeah, I had a difficult set of missions and a difficult, a difficult combat tour. So when I came home, I was a little bit uh, nervous. For example, I'd be driving along the, the road and a car would come by me and I didn't hear it when it was coming. I would dodge, like, <laughs> like you'd dodge if you were flying a plane. And uh, I did that for a while. So uh, I had a little bit of shell shock or combat fatigue or whatever you might call it for a while. Uh, naturally, I'm over that by now. See, individual people who were flying airplanes and walking on the ground and shooting at people, didn't know much about what was going on in the bigger scene. Uh, all I knew was to take an airplane and fly it to a target and fly it back and uh, bring my crew home safely. And that's what I did. Many people, uh, the, the uh, British bombed what they call, tar uh, called saturation bombing. Uh, a mosquito bomber would go in and drop a flare and then all the big bombers would come in and just drop whatever they, wherever they could. So they'd take a city out. And uh, we had the Norton bomb site, which was accurate. It uh, wasn't always used accurately, but it was an accurate bomb site. And uh, we were supposed to be able to hit a rail yard and not hit the city itself. And most of the time that happened. Most of the time we did do precision bombing. But sometimes there'd be a problem. The bomb might hang up in the, in the airplane and not drop when the bombardier intended it to. And that would drop into a different place than it should. And uh, that sometimes happened. Sometimes people made a mistake and just bombed the wrong place. And uh, so while the bomb site was a precision instrument, the in individual bombers were not necessarily uh, precision and they might make mistakes. So the bombardiers did sometimes overshoot where they meant to bomb, and then we would have collateral damage. And that happens in war. World War II was a terrible situation. It was all over the world. It was difficult. Many people were killed. We talk about a uh, thousand, a uh, hundred people being killed in Vietnam or, or in uh, overseas now, and we used to use, lose a thousand people in a, in a battle or more, and it was not an unusual battle. It would be a, a difficult battle, no doubt, but it was so much on so much larger scale than anything that's happened since, till it was entirely different. It was an entirely different war than we've had since. Thank goodness. <laughs>
don't get into wars. <laughs> By stay home. Don't try to go and and liberate somebody like the uh, like Truman. I mean, like um, Bush is trying to do overseas now. Stay home and defend yourself, and don't go out and try to fight a war somewhere else. Uh, pilots often wore flight jackets, and they often had them painted up in different ways. And uh, we were called the Eager Beavers. That was the uh, 368th Bomb Squadron's title, mm -hmm. if you will. And uh, so that's why this is. And of course, this is the old Eager Beaver himself, who was uh, one of our first pilots who flew when the first uh, when the squadron first went over. On the back, I have a B-17 and the fighter planes that escorted us, and uh, the, the P-38 and the P-51 and the, uh, wherever it is, is the uh, B-47. And uh, those were simply things that were painted on. 35 missions was how many missions I flew. 